Thank you, worship team. And uh, welcome everyone here at Crossroads and online. And uh, today is uh, the new year. Happy new year. Um, today is July, not July. <laughs> we'll be skipping ahead a little bit. Today is January the 3rd, 2021. Let's clap for the start of 2021. <laughs> You know, as I've been preparing for the message this week and thinking about entrance into the new year, I had to chuckle at a couple things that I remembered or I discovered that we began 2020 with a message series called Clear Vision 2020. And it's interesting, in hindsight, looking backwards, that with all that happened in 2020 that was completely unexpected and lots of upheaval and uh, stress and difficulty, um, hardships, adjustments, changes in all kinds of ways, um, perhaps in going through that difficulty and as we continue to deal with some of the difficulties associated with 2020 and COVID-19 and all the implications, Perhaps we've been learning and growing something about what is most important and that the clearer vision that we've gotten perhaps has come through the difficulty and the struggle and the uncertainty that we've dealt with and as we look forward with a certain degree of uncertainty. But one thing is certain and I think that's where um, we're going in this uh, message series in the book of Daniel as we kick off the new year. One thing is certain. That God is certain that as we just sang, He is, He was, He is to come, He always has been, He is, and He always will be, creator and sustainer of the universe, and His everlasting love for every human person. I'll say that again for every human person, because there's some folks sitting here and online. Who could be wrestling right now? Oh, you know, I've really screwed up this week or whatever. And I'm not worthy of God's love or this or that. And the truth is no one is worthy of God's love. God has made every human person with dignity and value made in his image, whether you're a man or a woman, whatever culture, whatever language, whatever your personality, whatever your skill sets are. Every human person has dignity and value because they're made in God's image. And God has poured out his love in so many ways in our, on our planet, in our universe, and manifests specifically, personally, in Jesus Christ. That is certain. That is secure. So as I was thinking about that, about, oh, we're going into the new year, and I was like, what is a new year? You know, it's just a, a way we mark time, I guess, but really a year is, it's just one rotation of the earth around the sun, which is quite further um, than I had actually thought about. I did a little research in it, and depending on where you are, I mean, in general, the earth, it's about like 580 million miles or 580 plus million miles, which is a lot. But depending on, you know, where you are on the earth, because the earth is also spinning, you know, so we're, we're, we're moving quite a bit. We're moving around the sun. The earth is spinning once every 24 hours, approximately 1,000 miles an hour. We spin as a, as a nation at the equator, not as a nation, as a world. And so there's all this distance that we're covering, and it just made me laugh because... In response to COVID this year, I, myself and other people have said, oh, I just don't get out. I just can't travel. I can't do the things. Well, actually, we've been traveling a ton, just like every year. We cover millions and millions of miles. And it's important to remember that all that is created and sustained by God. Sometimes our minds and modern culture would tend to want to disassociate God or religion or faith in God from the things that are in science or astronomy, the things that we're discovering. We shouldn't do that because there's ample evidence that this universe that we live in, that this solar system, this sun, this planet is not just arbitrary and didn't just happen, but there is intelligent design all throughout which it's not a big leap of faith to believe in a super intelligent being that dwells in all time, in all space, and always will be, and always has been, and is. And so again, you know, as we jump into 2021, of sure there's uncertainties, but God and his love for us 
particularly manifest in Jesus Christ, is certain. And the story of Daniel, the book of Daniel in the Old Testament, helps us see that um, in that time, we'll get into it in a minute after we pray, but there was all kinds of upheaval and uncertain and dramatic and abrupt change that Daniel and his cohorts and his people experienced. And it would have been very easy for them to come to the conclusion, oh, there is no God. God's abandoned us. We're not worthy. You know, it's, it's all up for grabs. But we see Daniel as a shiny example to help us see that God is sovereign all the time, even in difficult circumstances, and will lead us through, giving us his strength and his love. So let's join in prayer, and then we'll get into the heart of the message this morning. Lord, here we are, as we just sung here in, in the worship space. Um, you are holy, holy Lord God Almighty, the one who is, the one who was, the one who always will be. You are the constant in the universe, Lord. Jesus talked about heaven and earth will pass away, but his words will never pass away. And if you want stability in your life, put your faith in him. He's the rock. He's the focal point. You ground yourself in him, and your life is not going to be shaken irreparably to the core. Lord, our problem is, is that we go wandering in a wide variety of directions. We'd rather there's a part of us that, that likes the idea of you and wants to embrace you, but there's another part of us that struggles and wants to keep you at a distance or deny and wants to pretend we're our own God that we'd never say that. Help us, Lord. Help us hear your voice. Open our eyes and open our hearts to all that you have to say in your living active word. Thank you, Lord, that this word, that this revealed word to all humankind has stood the test of time and will continue to stand the test of time. Lord, we need to hear from you as we enter into a new journey around the sun, if you will. Lord, thank you that our lives are in your hands, our time is in your hands, and we are dearly loved in Christ. Lord, help us ground ourselves and center on you. Speak through me, speak through your living and active word. May we all be encouraged, may we all be challenged. Sure, right here in this room, but through online as well. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Well, I was mentioning, you know, about how we've done a lot of traveling um, this last year, and, you know, cosmically, if you will, and you've accumulated quite a bit of cosmic frequent flyer miles. I'm not sure what you can bank that in and get for that, but uh, anyway. Um, but on the subject of travel and moving, um, just a humorous story about myself that uh, I have both feet on the ground just like you. Um, my family knows that when we get into travel, and we've done quite a bit of travel because we have family out of state and stuff, that when we get in a car, um, I, I become a different person. Um, I become extremely goal-oriented, and I'm measuring the time, and I'm trying to be as efficient as possible to get to where we're going. And one of the annoying things that I used to do, I'd be like, okay, everyone, and this is a family of four, two of which are women. And, um, okay, now we're going to time it so that we're not going to eat, and we're not going to pee until we need gas, and we're going to do it all at once. And I'm going to go to the gas station, and I'll drop you off at the restaurant, and you can pee and get food, and I'll get gas and pee, and we'll, just, we'll be in and out of the stop. In 10 minutes, we'll be on our way. It seemed logical at the time. <laughs> I was told on many occasions that that was quite cruel. Um, I got to experience that cruelty of my own doing just this week. Took Emily back to Chicago, drove her, and I had done a lot of, it was the, the day after, it was the day of the, the heavy snow, so I shoveled like crazy Wednesday morning and was tired and exhausted, but I said I'd get her back, so I'd had coffee that morning, a lot of it apparently, <laughs> and, uh, and brought a 32 ounce Mountain Dew in the car to kind of want to be alert. And we're getting into the Chicago area, you know, the, the Kennedy Expressway and all that stuff, and it's busy. And all of a sudden, I'm like, oh. And you might say, why are you talking about this in church? <laughs> because our weak spots, our, our blind spots to other people's concerns and needs can tend to creep up us and get us when we least expect it, and that's what happened. 
So I got her to her apartment as we're talking and she's pointing things out. I said, hey, do you want to go by the, the school where the kids that I work at? I'm, no, no, honey, can we just get to your place? And she's like, you're really uncomfortable. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so we get there and she said, well, okay, let's get our stuff and we'll go up the stairs. No, can we just get up to your apartment right now and I'll come back? And I physically had trouble getting out of the car. It was really bad. So I have developed a greater understanding for those that get you know, challenged in those circumstances through my own, you know, sometimes that's how it happens. You have to go through the difficulty of another to develop a care. And you know, and that's one of the benefits of this 2020 as well, isn't it? That we've all gone through difficulties. Maybe things that we, you know, we had this planned so well, professionally, financially, relationally, physically, health-wise, and it blew up. And we experienced the pain and the struggle and the anxiety, and then God walks us through it. And now we're better equipped, aren't we? To be compassionate, to be kind, to be caring to others who go through similar circumstances. It's funny how that works. So anyway, on to Daniel. Um, I'm not going to... It would not be possible in this time to give you the whole history and the backdrop of what's going on in the kingdom of Israel. Let's just say this. Remember the civil war in our country where this one united nation over a period of time divided? Israel had its heyday as a united kingdom from about 1050 B.C. to about 930 B.C. Samuel was raised up, Saul was raised up as the first king, David was raised up, and then Solomon. This was Israel's heyday, about 120 years of united and prosperous and the blessing of God as they worshiped God together. And then after Solomon, it started to break apart because the leaders strayed from worshiping God and started worshiping themselves and the people strayed from worshiping God and, wor and all of a sudden it became a northern kingdom and a southern kingdom and they operated separately and they each had their own tremendous struggles with walking away from God as the priority in their life when you worship yourself or when you worship the things it makes it you, you become less able to cooperate with other people and so the kingdom broke apart and so they went through a hundred, you know, several years. Well, the northern kingdom went through 108 years before it was overrun by the Assyrian Empire. The southern kingdom, the northern kingdom was called Israel. The southern kingdom was called Judah. The southern kingdom went through about 344 years before it was overrun by Babylon. All things that were prophesied by God that, you know what, you want to... Leave me to the side and push me into the back burner. Okay, you're on your own and disaster is going to come your way. And so we pick up the story in Daniel in the southern kingdom of Judah as it's about to be overrun by the Babylonian Empire and Nebuchadnezzar the king. And one of the practices that was common in that day when one empire or one nation overran another one Oftentimes they would gather up, once they'd conquered and killed and done what they'd done to neutralize, they would take the royalty and the high profile and the educated persons and different aspects of the military and they would take them away from their own country and take them to the conquering nation in order to be re-educated, to be acclimated, to basically become a new identity because you've now been subjugated. And that's what's happened in, Ju in Judah, in the southern kingdom. Nebuchadnezzar took over and then took the cream of the crop, the influencers, those that could stir up trouble in the homeland, and took them to re-educate them and into captivity and left the poorest, most fragmented people there who would never cause any ruckus but could produce crops and things that would benefit the conquering kingdom. That's where we pick up the story. And in this story, in this description of this history in Israel, which is instructive for all of us, um, it's personally, um, in groups, as a nation, as a family, we meet Daniel and three of his 
colleagues. They're part of the exiles that are taken away to a new country. Can you imagine? You know, some of us have 18, 19, 20, 21, 22. Some of us are very close to that age as well. Can you imagine being a conquering army came, grabbed you, or grabbed your loved one, and took them away from you in order to be re-educated and to become a different nationality and speak a different language and learn their literature and culture in order to serve in that government or in that court. It'd be unbelievably traumatic. That's what's going on and going on here. So follow with me. I'm going to read chunks of scripture and then try and describe it and help us see how it connects to us. Daniel chapter 1. And the whole key on this, if we get anything, is that even in traumatic, unexpected, painful circumstances, that God is sovereign and God does care and God will bring benefit out of it and we can take advantage of the opportunity if we are available. Daniel chapter 1, verse 1. In the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, Nebuchadnezzar, who I just mentioned, king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem and besieged it. And the Lord delivered Jehoiakim into his hand. That's a really quick to say. Further detailed descriptions in other places, scriptures they built the siege works. And, you know, imagine, if you will, the Lord of the Rings when they take over Helm's Deep. And all they basically came in and overran the city and destroyed it. The Lord delivered Jehoiakim into the hand of the invading king Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon, along with some of the articles from the temple. These he carried off to the temple of his God in Babylonia and put in the treasure house of his God. This was a demonstrative thing of our God is stronger than your God. We are subjugating you. You will have to assimilate and bow down to our God because he is stronger because we conquer very symbolic. Your national identity is destroyed. Your God is destroyed. We're now taking over. If you want to live, you have to become one of us. Verse 3. Then the king, king, the king of Babylon, Nebuchadnezzar, ordered Ashpenaz, chief of his court officials, to bring into the king's service some of the Israelites from the royal family and the nobility. Young men without any physical defect, handsome, showing aptitude for every kind of learning, well-informed, quick to understand, and qualified to, to serve in the king's palace. In other words, we want the best of your best, the best and the brightest, because they're coming to our nation and they are going to become, we're going to make them like us, we're going to re-educate them. They're going to learn to speak our language. They're going to learn our culture, our history, our literature. And then they're going to serve in the king's court because we want the sharpest and the brightest, best and the brightest. And we don't really care that we're taking them from your nation. And what Ashpenaz was supposed to do, he was to teach them the language and the literature of the Babylonians. That's in verse 4. And then the king assigned them a daily amount of food and wine from the king's table. And the king's table had the best of foods, the best of wine. And he's the king. And so these that had the potential to serve in the king's court would get the very best because they want the very best for the king. And they were to be trained for three years. Three years. And then they would have opportunity to enter the king's service. Again, not in their nation, hundreds of miles away, in a foreign place, in a foreign environment. Verse 6 goes on. Among them, among those who were chosen, some from Judah, Judah, that southern kingdom of Israel, some from Judah, Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, I think I said that like I was going to say something more. <laughs> it just says their name. Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. Sometimes the type is a little small and I lose my place. The chief official then gave them new names. You heard me correctly. Gave them new names. And to Daniel, the name Belteshazzar was given. To Hananiah, Shadrach. 
to Mishael, Meshach, and to Azariah, Abednego. Gave them new names that were consistent or appropriate within Babylonian culture and language. Again, this was step one in changing their identity, in changing their loyalty, in making them servants of a new king, a new nation, a new God. Verse 8 says, But Daniel resolved not to defile himself with the royal food and wine, and he asked the chief official for permission not to defile himself this way. The issue here is not that Daniel would never drink wine. The issue here is that in this culture and this time, the food and the wine at the king's table were offered to a foreign god. Were offered to... So Daniel's like, I want no part of taking in something that's offered to a foreign god that acknowledges in any way a foreign god which I don't believe in because my god is the everlasting god. And I don't care that they've overrun us. God is still God. And I'm going to worship and serve him. So Dan it says that Daniel resolved. Daniel made a decision. Daniel went against the grain and against the flow. And he resolved not to defile himself with the royal food and the wine. Because it had been offered in sacrifice in worship to a foreign god. And he asked the chief official for permission not to defile himself this way. Impressively done. I'm not going to defile myself by eating food offered and to worshiping another God. But I'm going to be respectful of the people that are in charge of me. Yes, ultimately God has my heart, God has my soul, but these people are in charge of me now and that's just the way it is. And so he asked for permission. It doesn't give us the exact wording, but I'll bet it was something like this. Chief official, I want to honor and to serve the king well when I have the opportunity. I'm going to give myself to the study of the language. I'm going to give myself to the study of the literature. And I am going to do my best. But for me to do my best, I need to be loyal to what's deep within me. And that's my love and worship of God. And I can't eat this food. Could, you, could we do something different? Now you might say, Steve, that's reading between the lines. Perhaps a little bit. But it's no accident that says he resolved, he determined, but then he didn't defy. It says he asked for permission. So, you know, I'm going to let God figure it out. He asked for permission. In verse 9 it says, And God caused the chief official to show favor and compassion to Daniel. His job was to acculturate them, to assimilate them, so that they became Babylonians. That they worshipped their king, that they worshipped their god. That was his job. That's what he would be accountable for. But very easy. I'm sorry. My job is to make you one of us. That means you've got to eat our stuff, you've got to drink, and that's it. But the scripture says, God, in spite of the expectation that would have been on this official, God, in response to Daniel being willing to put himself at risk and to ask the question, God caused the official to show favor and compassion to Daniel. But the official did say to Daniel, you know, I'm afraid. I'm afraid of my lord the king, whom I serve. I'm afraid of my lord the king who assigned your food and drink. He gave the order that you should have the best of the king's table, his food, his drink. I'm afraid of the king who assigned you your food and, food and drink. Should he see you looking worse than any of the other young men who are in this training program, the king then would have my head. Because, because that's how the king operates. If he gave an order that you're supposed to have such and such food, and he notices, or anyone notices, that you and the guys aren't looking up to speed because you've been eating something different, and it comes that I've disobeyed his order, it's my head. At the cost of your well-being, that's a genuine concern, don't you think? 
Some of us have worked in settings where we are accountable to people above us, and we've had persons that you do what I say exactly, or it's your head. Maybe not with a sword, but other ways. This stuff relates to real life now. So Daniel, seeing the distress, but the compassion that this man had, he said, hey, in verse 11, in verse 12, why don't we do a test? Please test your servants. Yes, we are Jews from Judah. Yes, you're trying to make us Babylonians. There's a part of us that we really have to keep our identity as, but you know what? We are your servants. We are going to serve the king. We are going to, he says, please test your servants, meaning he and his three buddies, test your servants for 10 days. Give us nothing but vegetables to eat and water to drink. Then compare our appearance with that of the young men who eat the royal food and who drink the royal drink, and then treat your servants according to what you see. In other words, let's test it for 10 days, and your concerns are valid that if we look bad, it's going to be your head. If we in any way look bad, according to your principles and according to your, what your concerns are, you have the freedom then to just, what do, you, what do you say? It's okay. Verse 14, so he agreed. The man who was in charge of them, whose head was on the chopping block, if they succumbed and looked worse in any way, said, okay, so he agreed to this, and he tested them for 10 days. And at the end of the 10 days, they looked healthier and better nourished than any of the other young men who ate the royal food. And so the guard said, Okay, we're taking away the choice food. We're taking away the wine. And we're just giving them vegetables and water because it's working. The scripture goes on to say in verse 17, To these four young men, Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, Azariah, who now had Babylonian names when they were with the Babylonians, to these four young men, God gave knowledge and understanding of all kinds of literature and learning. And Daniel could understand visions and dreams of all kinds. If you've got the text in front of you that I, that I put out, you may notice that I underlined all kinds twice. God gave them knowledge and understanding of all kinds in literature and learning. And Daniel could understand visions and dreams of all kinds. Twice the scripture says all kinds. Versatility. God gave them wisdom and knowledge and versatility. You know, why? You know, there's, a, there's a school of thought, particularly in modern culture, that, well, yeah, religious stuff is religious stuff. If you say you have a relationship with God or you read the scriptures, you know, it's just relevant in that domain. It has no broader application. You know, the whole God thing, we need to keep it in its proper place. And you can use it in that context. But in the real world, the real that we live in, in business, and in relationships, and in finance, and politics, and all that, eh, you know, be careful. We, we keep that off to the side. They were in a highly charged political environment. There were going to be massive expectations on them. It says, God, God gave them knowledge and understanding of all kinds in all areas. Then it mentioned Daniel had a specific ability to understand all kinds of dreams and visions. In verse 18, at the end of the time set by the king and to bring them into his service, the chief official presented them to the king, presented them to Nebuchadnezzar for evaluation. Here they are. Here are the guys that went through the three years of the training program and included in the people that were brought before Nebuchadnezzar were the four from Judah. In verse 19, it says, the king talked with them personally. And he found out in talking with them and with others, basically he was testing them, that there was none equal in this whole pr training program of young men from different cultures and other people from Judah. These four were distinctive. They distinguished themselves. So much so that the king, when he talked with them, He was impressed. None were equal to these four. And so they entered the king's service. And in every matter of wisdom 
and understanding about which the king questioned them, the king found them ten times better than all the magicians and enchanters in his whole kingdom. His, the established people in his court, his, the people that he relied on, his go-to people, the magicians, the enchanters, and other informed people, these kids, these young men were sharper than any of them. Because God gave them knowledge and understanding that was versatile in all kinds of situations. And Daniel remained there in the king's service until the first year of King Cyrus, long after, we'll get to that in weeks to come, long after this king, Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, was in charge of this region. Daniel continued to be there, advising, and we'll get to that in the future. What are some takeaways for us? And we need to, to wrap up. I've been kind of going at length here. Three quick takeaways. And I encourage you to read this passage of Scripture on your own because God's Word is living and active. And through the Spirit, as you ask God to show you things, He will bring up things perhaps better and more specific to you than what I'm going to mention. Takeaway number one. If we want to trust God and follow God through great difficulty, we need to anchor ourselves in God. And when we do this, it solidifies our identity. Remember, this was all about identity conversion here. You, we don't like, we're taking over, and you need to conform and mold to us. It's very important. You know, the scripture talks about in Romans 12, 2. Right, right, it's not in your paper, right? Romans 12, 2. Don't conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed through the renewing of your mind. Then you'll be able to test and approve what God's will is. There's certain aspects of world's, the world's thinking that would like to squeeze us into its mold, that you need to think this way, you need to become like us. Put your God on the back burner, put him in the little box that our, we want to put him in, where it's just for those purposes. It's very important that we anchor our identity in God and his everlasting love. We can have a tendency to anchor our identities in our performance. Maybe it's our professional performance. Maybe it's our physical and strength performance. Maybe it's our mental and intellectual performance. Maybe it's relational performance. Do I have someone? Or can someone call me? You know, we have all kinds of ways that we try and craft an identity for ourselves based on achievement or things that we can show to ourselves or show to others. See, I'm worthwhile, I'm valuable. This is who I am. All that stuff is unstable. God is the only thing that is unshakable, and we need to anchor ourselves, anchor our identities in God and his love for us. That's what gives stability. That's what gives solidness. That's what gave Daniel the ability to be himself and then ultimately distinguish himself and his colleagues in this pressure cooker that he was in. Second, follow God's lead to contribute positively. You know, one thing we don't see in the scriptures that Daniel and the other three guys, they're not like, oh, this really stinks. Boy, we've been dealt a bad hand. Uh, you know, we're, I'm, we're just going to give up. And we could go on and on. You don't see Daniel, even though their circumstances were devastatingly difficult, all the hopes and dreams that they had as young men, 19, 20 years old, boom, blown up. We don't see them having a pity party, checking out on God. They're following God's lead. Like, you know what? This is less than ideal. This is not what we planned. But you know what? We're going to believe that God is here anyway. And we're going to follow his lead, and we're going to find a way to contribute positively, even if it's to a conquering king and a conquering culture. We are going to ascend within this great difficulty. Follow God's lead. Believe that God is going in front of you, even in the most difficult and unexpected and painful circumstances. 
anchor ourselves in our identity in God, follow God's lead in less than ideal circumstances in order to say, I'm going to contribute positively. I'm going to find the silver lining in this. The silver lining is God. And last, third, trust in God's help to uphold you, to uphold you for his God upheld Daniel. God upheld Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. And the second I walk off the stage, I'm going to forget the other three names. But Daniel, I always remember. See, remember, God upheld them because he, and he gave them knowledge and understanding in order that they could excel in the difficult context that they were in. God didn't take them out of the difficult context. He gave them knowledge and understanding and helped them excel within the difficult context in order that God would be glorified and that people could see the living act of God at work. I don't know what 2021 has for me. I don't know what it has for you. Sure, there's uncertainties. It's likely many unexpected things will happen. Perhaps difficult and painful things. But this I do know. According to the scriptures, according to the living word of God, what will remain the same is God Almighty, creator and sustainer, the, the one who loves each of us personally and has demonstrated that in Christ. And that can give us the stability that we need to contribute positively and to be upheld and to be distinctive rather than just going with the flow. Let's pray. Lord, thank you that you are the living, active God. Lord, thank you that you always have been, you are, and you always will be, and that your everlasting love uniquely manifest in Jesus, is available to everyone. So Lord, I pray that you would help us turn to you, maybe for the first time, or return to you in faith, if that's what's needed, and to pour out our concerns and our weaknesses and our failings and ask for your help, because Lord, you understand and you love us. Lord, as we're going to see in the weeks ahead, you have an amazing ability to give us the strength that we need, and to elevate us. Lord, there's so much in our culture that says, elevate yourself, call attention to yourself, wave your banner, wave your flag. Lord, if we worship you and trust you, you do the elevating as needed. That other stuff is a waste of time and a waste of energy. Thank you, Lord, that we can trust in you. Thank you that Jesus came. Thank you that Jesus died on the cross. Thank you that Jesus rose from the grave, achieving victory over sin and death, and wants to share that victory in a loving relationship with everyone. Help us to live these things out. Help us to think these things out. It's in your name we pray, Lord. Amen. Well, that's uh, our starter in the book of Daniel. We'll probably have a, a better name for the series besides Daniel uh, next week, but we're off and running. See you next time.